don't hear anyone, I'm starting to record our session so that you can also afterwards look into the tutorial. Afterwards, we will uh, we have a script, a tutorial script, where you can um, go through the different parts that uh, Tony will present. I will also add a link uh, with uh, the part that I will do. Uh, so the main part, of course, will be done by, do, done by Tony Zagrista, who is our uh, the main uh, or basically the only software developer of Gaia Sky. And uh, he's really a master of visualization, as you will see. And I'm very happy that I can use this program also for, um, for videos that were produced for outreach purposes. And the last videos uh, you could see, uh, these are EDR3 videos. And about one of the EDR3 videos, I will show you um, how one, how, uh, what kind of script I used in order to produce the one on the 100 parsec sample. So that will be at the end of our session. Um, Tony is happy with uh, having questions in between. So whenever you have a question, uh, at, at least if it, it's not too many, then, then certainly we, you can just switch on your microphone and ask your question at a reasonable point of his um, presentation. I will, during his presentation, also follow uh, through the chat so that I can look a little bit whether there are questions that uh, were not asked in during the presentation. And um, yeah, so uh, let's just start. And um, I also want to mention shortly that there are video tutorials that Tony uh, from time to time already published so that if you are interested in certain aspects of Gaia Sky, um, then uh, also look at these video tutorials. They are very helpful. And of course, uh, into the documentation of Gaia Sky, because um, there is really a very, very comprehensive documentation of Gaia Sky uh, on the Gaia Sky webpage. But now, um, if there are no questions, I will hand over to Tony for his presentation. Okay, so... Um... Let me first share my screen. Okay, can you see that? Yes. Good. Yeah, so welcome to this um, tutorial or workshop. Um, I don't have a presentation, but I prepared a, a small script that we will roughly follow. Um, during um, this session, I'll um, break up Gaia Sky and we'll just um, work through uh, this uh, little script that you can find um, a link to in this um, in the um, wiki. So if you go to the, um, to the uh, meeting page in the wiki, and uh, you go to this uh, Sky tutorial session, that brings you here. And you can find a link here, the tutorial script. And there's a mirror in my website, just in case uh, the other one goes out. Um, okay, so something else I wanted to mention. Yeah, so the way I'll structure this is there's a first uh, big part where I'll um, basically um, go over um, the main features of Gaia Sky. And then after that, I'll, um, uh, Stefan, as, as he said, uh, he'll uh, present a script that uh, he used to make, to make one of the videos uh, for EDR3. Um, and after that, we can have a Q&A session if there's questions. But uh, as Stefan already said, so feel free to interrupt me while I'm doing uh, stuff. Uh, it's, it's fine. Uh, since this is not a presentation, I'll just uh, pause and try to answer your, your questions. OK, so uh, let's start. Um, what will uh, we cover in this uh, tutorial? Basically, uh, we'll learn about uh, the basic uh, controls of Gaia Sky and how to navigate the scene. Um, we'll talk about the user interface, uh, how to locate basic information like uh, the current focus object, uh, the nearest object to the camera, uh, whether the time is on or off, etc. Then um, I'll talk about um, the debug information, how to bring it up and why it may be important. Uh, then uh, we'll talk about the time controls, after that, um, the camera modes, uh, special render modes uh, will enable and disable uh, 
components visibility. So we'll talk about what components do we have and how to um, control their visibility. Um, also the promotion vectors, uh, which have some special controls and I'll show that too. Uh, then we'll um, go over the different shading options that we have in Gaia Sky. After that, uh, we'll uh, look at how to load uh, additional um, data sets uh, in a VO table, CSV format, uh, or fits. Um, then we'll uh, kind of go over how to work with data sets. So we'll learn how to highlight them, uh, how to apply different properties, how to filter uh, different stars, um, and so on. After that, uh, we'll have a look at um, how to show external information. So this uh, means uh, connection to, um, so which pulls information from the Wikipedia or from the Gaia archive itself. Uh, then we'll look at uh, the camera paths and how to record uh, and play back uh, camera path files. And also a keyframe system that we have to define camera paths. And finally, uh, we'll learn how to script Gaia Sky. Uh, and this is, um, is not going to be like a full on tutorial and scripting because that would take uh, hours probably, but just a little introduction on how to script it. So what we will not talk about in this tutorial. So we'll not show how to install Gaia Sky in the different operating systems. We will not talk about uh, performance and uh, optimization. Uh, there is a web page or a section in the documentation somewhere which uh, talks about this. We won't talk about the data formats and levels of detail uh, catalogs. Uh, I will not talk about the internal, so how, how it works. Um, I'll not talk about the internal reference system used. So basically the most in-depth stuff we will not cover here. I will not um, talk about uh, the um, virtual reality um, mode that it has system folders, um, how to run it from source or uh, what are the command line arguments that you can use. Um, we will not learn about uh, how to produce videos in depth. I'll not talk about the bookmarking system or the uh, how to connect different instances um, to make it run in a multi-display or multi-projector <laughs> setup. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't understand. Some have the okay. mic not. Sorry, moving. sorry. Okay, so um, let's start. But before starting, um, it may be good if you have a local installation of Gaia Sky, even though it's it's not required at all because I'll, I'll be doing everything here locally. But if you want to follow along, um, you can just um, install it. Just go on the website and, and get it there. Um, so let's see, let's bring up Gaia Sky first. Uh, I'll launch it. And I'll put it uh, here. So when you um, launch Gaia Sky for the first time, you get something like this screen. Um, if you click on this button here, the dataset manager, that's actually the only button you can click at the beginning because you don't have any data. So what I'll do now is I'll just change the location of my data here to an empty folder. And now I don't have any data set. So I'll go ahead and get uh, the first uh, required data set, which is the base data pack. This contains solar system uh, objects, basically the sun and the, the earth. So I'll go ahead and download this now. OK, so now, as you can see, uh, let me um, it says that uh, you only have um, the base data pack. Uh, it lets you start Gaia Sky, but it warns you about maybe you should get some other data sets, otherwise uh, the uh, experience will be a bit poor. So uh, what I'll do is I'll switch back to, wait, maybe uh, I should uh, first explain how to um, get net data sets. So if you want to get new data sets, um, you basically uh, come here to the um, data download and check uh, whatever data sets you want. Uh, for example, I'm, I'm, I'm getting some feedback. Uh, so some, someone yeah, so Tony, has... Tony, is it possible to zoom a little bit more in into the 
um, Gaia Sky Screen, so that uh, I don't know whether this is possible, or make the you the the can you also uh, make the fonts larger in that so that one can yes, read? but um, I need to start Gaia Sky and then go to the preferences. Yes, maybe you um, do it. I think it's worth it. You cannot read that. Um, hardly. Okay. Uh, I can uh, read it, but I know a, a little bit more uh, what it is about. <laughs> okay, so I'll just uh, increase the. Um, maybe that's enough. And now uh, let's close it and bring it up again. Okay, better? I think it's better, yes. Okay, so um, now I, uh, before I just unloaded the base data pack, if you want to get other uh, data sets, you can get, for example, the high resolution textures so that uh, that would get you um, some high uh, and ultra definition textures for some of the planets and moons. Here we have a selection of uh, Gaia star catalogs. Um, these are with uh, levels of detail. Uh, this means that not the whole data set is loaded at once, but uh, you can forget about that. We have, uh, for example, the default and the small and the medium and the, up to the full. And these are different cuts with the parallax error as a criteria that you can get. And you can, um, for example, here, you can see how many objects each of these has. Uh, the default one has 14 million objects and it weighs about one gigabyte. And the full has 1.4 billion, and uh, it weighs about 50 gigabytes. Then we have um, other Gaia, uh, Gaia star catalogs, like uh, the GD1 stream or the Gaia catalog of nearby stars that we've seen a presentation of before. Then we also have other star catalogs. For example, here we have the Hipparchus uh, new reduction catalog. Then we have galaxy catalogs. Um, here we have the uh, nearby galaxies catalog or different cuts of the SDSS. Um, open cluster catalog. So we have the open cluster ZR2 and the Milky Way star cluster. And other catalogs, so uh, nebulae, um, a black hole. And finally, we have a few meshes uh, which were prepared by Kevin Jardin. So I'll just go ahead now and switch back to my old folder because I've got all the data there. And I'll select this, and as you can see, all of these data sets are already in my disk, so I can use them. Okay, um, just a second. And, and one nice thing is that if you have a connection problem during the loading, actually, if you then um, start reloading, then it will continue at the point where the loading stopped. That's a new nice feature. Yeah. So by default, um, when you download new data sets, Sky, Sky will select them by default. Uh, by uh, default, otherwise you can just go here before starting Sky, Sky and select the data sets that you want to load. Uh, now, for example, I'll just select the default um, EDR three data set, and then maybe in, if you select two or more star catalogs, I think it will complain because usually there's overlaps. So it it warns you that maybe you should not select two or more Gaia-based star um, catalogs. Um, I'll select, uh, for example, nearby galaxies and um, SDSS DR12 and open clusters and nebulae and maybe the dust maps. And I'll just go ahead and um, start Gaia Sky. So we just need to wait for it to load now. Okay, um, so let's start with the basic controls. Um, when you start Gaia Sky, it puts you um, it puts you automatically in uh, focus mode with the uh, default focus being the Earth. You can change that in the properties file, but uh, yeah, if you want to do that, uh, just uh, go ahead and look it up in the docs because it's you need to edit the file. So basically, here we have uh, the uh, focus info uh, or the focus information here. 
which tells us that we are in focus mode. Here we have the quick information bar, and here is the control panel that we will talk about later. Um, so let's uh, do some movement. Uh, in focus mode, uh, the camera is basically locked onto your focus object. So if we um, click with the left mouse button and drag, you'll see that we orbit around the object. We can also click with the right mouse button and drag. And what it does, it offsets the um, focus object from the uh, center. But the movement is still locked. So as you can see now, the Earth is not in the center, but we're still orbiting it. Um, we can also use um, the um, mouse wheel to move closer to the object or move away from it, on the focus object. And we can also use the um, cursors, the arrows on your keyboard to move closer uh, or go uh, away from the object or also rotate around. As you can see at the bottom, you should see what I'm pressing. Um, with the shift, if you press shift and then drag with your uh, left mouse button, you roll the camera. So this is the roll um, control. And I think that should cover the basic uh, movements. So let's go through. Uh, how to select objects. So um, if you want to select a different object and put uh, set them as your focus, you just click on the object. So for example, I'll just, uh, I see the moon is here. So I'll just double click on the moon. And now, as you can see, the moon is our focus object and we can move to the moon and away from it. Or we can also look up objects by name. Um, for that, you just press F. And this brings up this um, search dialog. And here we can enter any name. So, for example, um, if we want, we want to go to Mars, we just do M A R, and here we could select it uh, like this in this drop down that appears. Or we can just um, include the full name, and that would select the object once uh, the resolution is complete. So, let's go back to Mars. And now we are focused on Mars. We can use our mouse wheel uh, to go there, or we can also use, for example, this um, button here, which um, will take control of Gaia Sky and bring us to the focus object. So when we, whenever we click this button, Gaia Sky will zoom into the object until, until it is very close. Um, yeah, there's another uh, option, which is uh, pressing Control G. Um, so this brings us instantly to the um, to very close to the focus object. So wherever you are, you can just, for example, uh, enter Saturn and press Control G, and then we are in Saturn automatically and instantly. Um, at any time, we can press the home button in our keyboard to bring us back to the um, home object, in this case, the Earth. So I'll just press home now, and we're back on the Earth. OK, if so let's. Show, if so if you are in the solar system, maybe you also show Gaia. <laughs> yeah, Gaia is here. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, joli. Here is Gaia. <coughs> Maybe we'll make it move later. So let's go back to home object and let's look at the user interface. Um, I'll try to. Do you see that window? No. Okay. Um, wait. Uh, I'll try to maybe let's set this one like this. Okay, um, so there's uh, basically three components or main components in the user interface. Uh, the most important being uh, the um, control panel, um, which is this window here. Then we have the quick information bar at the top. And at the, uh, to the right, we have the focus information bay. Okay. 
so we can open the um, control panel with you and close again, close it again with you, or we can click on the title bar. Um, this panel contains a few panes. Um, we have the time pane, which has time controls. So this uh, lets us uh, start and stop time and change the work factor. Then we have the camera pane, which uh, lets us um, select the camera mode, uh, limit the speed, and set uh, rotation speed, uh, time speed, change the field of view of the camera, um, change the behavior. For example, we have here the uh, cinematic behavior, which um, it keeps moving uh, if you don't do anything. So basically, with a um, regular mode, the camera stops as as, uh, as soon as you stop moving it. With the cinematic mode, the camera just keeps moving. So for example, now I just applied a rotation here, and it, it just keeps rotating on. Um, we have the type visibility. Here we have a few toggles uh, or buttons which we can use to toggle the visibility of different components. Then we have some visual settings. Uh, these uh, basically change the appearance of stars and lightning in the scene. Uh, we can change things like label size or the line width, uh, et cetera. And we can reset uh, them to the default uh, with this button. We have the data sets uh, pane, uh, which contains all of the data sets that we have loaded. Um, we'll see uh, how to use it uh, later. Then we have bookmarks. Uh, I will not talk about this, but uh, if you want to um, know more about them, you can uh, go to the docs. Um, there's a section on bookmarks. And finally, there's a music pane that I will not uh, cover here. So uh, here at the bottom, we have a few buttons. Um, there's this one, which uh, brings up the minimap here. Um, the minimap uh, basically. Uh, yeah, it's it's a minimap, so you can see your location. There's a top projection and a side projection, um, and uh, it's uh, contextual. So it depends on where you are. Uh, you see a different uh, minimap. So now we are um, going out of the solar system and through the Gaia stars. Uh, in this case here, um, it contains uh, some of the icy surfaces uh, by Kevin Jordan. And then once we exit, uh, yeah, now we see already the Milky Way. And if we continue on, we will just um, see the local group and uh, etc. So let's go back home. Then we have this button here, which is to load uh, additional catalogs. Uh, we'll talk about that later also. Then we have the preferences or settings. You can, um, yeah, just feel free to explore. There's lots of settings that you can um, play with. Then we have uh, here the uh, system lock. Uh, that's exactly the same that you have in the window that you launch uh, Guy Sky in. Uh, but uh, for example, in Windows, you don't usually see that, so that's why it, it, I included it because uh, sometimes it helps for debugging or tackling uh, down problems. We have here uh, the help um, dialog uh, with some additional uh, information on Gaia Sky and the system and updates. So if there's a new version, you can check it here. And we would use this uh, to close or to exit Gaia Sky. Okay, to the top we have the quick uh, information bar here. Um, you can see now there's like four components. First, uh, time, and then we have focus, closest, and home. So the time, um, it's quite obvious. It's just a, a simulation time. Um, we can all, always use Control R to make it match to your uh, system time. So if I press now Control R, uh, it will probably jump to 58 or something like that. So 1258 UTC. You can see I just pressed Control R and now it's 1258. Then we have the focus object here. Um, and uh, just allow me to change some settings um, here. So the focus object is basically the object that uh, is uh, currently your focus. Uh, 
And if you can see here, I activated um, the uh, crosshairs and there's three of them uh, with different colors. So the focus object has the green crosshair. If I change this to the moon, you can see that the other two are still here, but the uh, moon <coughs> is now our focus object and that's why it has the uh, green uh, crosshair on it. Then we have our closest object. So let's bring the focus back to the Earth and I'll just move a bit the camera so that the moon is our closest object and it changed again. So as you can see now, closest object is the moon. So the moon has the blue crosshair now because it's closer to the camera and the Earth has the other two. And then we have the home object and this uh, usually doesn't change and it's defined in a properties file uh, that you can edit. Um, if you want to know how to do that, uh, yeah, look it up in the docs. Hmm. Okay, um, now let's look at uh, this panel here. Basically, if you're on focus mode, um, this has three sections, one for the focus with all of these uh, information um, related to that focus object here at the top. Then we have a mouse pointer um, panel, which tells you basically the um, alpha and delta of uh, your current mouse pointer. So you can see you can also um, see it here projected on the sides of the screen. And then there's the latitude and longitude. This, uh, this gets activated when you are on an object. Uh, so for example, now I'll um, roll my mouse over the Earth, and you will see that the latitude and longitude here change. So now, as you can see, you can use that to position your um, mouse pointer to wherever you want and maybe um, I just uh, pressed my left mouse button and this brings up this, this uh, context menu and you can land on this position, um, for example, and you can use uh, this information here to guide your clicking. Um, what else? Uh, finally, we have the camera uh, pane, which uh, contains the velocity of the camera and uh, its position. So when the camera is not moving, velocity is zero. As soon as I move the camera, you see that the velocity um, gets activated. And also the position, well, it, it just changes the position in the internal reference system, which is an equatorial Cartesian system. OK, um, now let's look at the uh, debug uh, panel. Um, we offer some additional information in the form of a debug panel that you can activate uh, by clicking here on the preferences or hitting P. So if I just hit P, uh, that brings up the preferences um, uh, screen. And we go to system. And here we have a checkbox, which reads show debug information. And we'll activate that. And we see that the debug uh, information panel um, is here. So we can. Um, by default, it just shows the uh, frames per second and the frame time here. So frames per second in green and the frame time uh, in white. But we can open it so that we get more information with uh, this little plus sign. And here we get um, some additional um, info on our graphics device or the time, uh, the session time. So I've been at it for almost 20 minutes now. Then we have information about the memory, so the used uh, and free memory, and also the allocated and the total memory allowed. This is the system memory. Then some uh, additional numbers for the uh, graphics memory. And then we have uh, here uh, the amount of objects that are loaded into the main memory and the ones which are on display. So basically, this number here is the number of objects which are on in the RAM, so in the system memory, and here is the number of objects which are also in uh, the graphics memory, the RAM. And then we have uh, some additional um, numbers here on the levels of detail. So this disappears if you don't have uh, levels of detail uh, catalog here. Basically, it tells you about the number of buttons uh, which are observed and whether they we have some um, buttons which are queued for loading. And I'll try to 
Yes, so as you can see now, there are seven queues, and as they get loaded, this will go down. So as you can see now, it, it's at zero because all of them loaded already. So you can use that to see uh, if, uh, if everything is working properly. Finally, we have um, the status of SAMP, and I'll to demonstrate that, I'll just bring up Talcott. Um, is this so, Mark Taylor very happy he's online here as well? Yeah, later I'll just talk it again. Now it's just to show that uh, we can connect with the same. So I just bring brought up uh, Topcat. And Gaskai is just a SAM client, meaning that it doesn't provide the hub, but we can use something else like Topcat or Labin to um, uh, provide this hub. So as you can see now, it's, um, it's connected already to the hub. And we could uh, go here and see that Gaskai is one of the clients. And we'll um, revisit that later. And we can just close this debug, um, the debug panel. And to make it disappear, we can also uh, press Control D. Um, OK, so let's have a look at time. And by default, time is off. We can start it with the space bar or by clicking on this, um, on this button here. So I'll just press space. And as you can see here, it now says time times one. This means that uh, the rate of time in the simulation is equal to the rate of time in real life or system time. If we press space bar again, it, does, uh, it says us uh, the time is off now. So let's uh, start it again. And um, things are moving quite slowly because um, yeah, you, you won't see any movement on the earth or anything else at this rate. Maybe on Gaia, you could see it rotating very, very slowly. But I'm not sure about that either. Yeah, even Gaia is difficult to, it moves, but very, very slowly. So what we can do is we can use the comma and dot to increase or decrease the work factor. This makes time faster. So I'll just use dot a few times. And as you can see, the factor here increases. It doubles every time. So now we are at 64 times the speed of time. And we can increase it further. And as you can see, uh, things start to move. So we, we can go back to the Earth. And maybe increase it a bit further. And since we are focused on the Earth, um, we are our, our position is um, relative to it. So that's why everything is orbiting around us. But so maybe we can select the Sun. So bring up the search dialog and type in Sun. And now uh, we are locked on the Sun and everything moves around it. So we can make this uh, much faster or slower. And here we can also use this slider to control the time. And at some point, we can also make time go backwards. So now everything is reversed, as you can see. When we change from plus to minus, the uh, trail, the orbit trails change. And we can go back. So now we are at uh, 2025. Let's go back a bit. Twenty-four, twenty-three. Okay. We can stop time with space and press Control R to reset it to the current time. So now this puts us at the um, initial position. Um, what else? Yeah, we can make, um, so let's focus on the sun and go out a bit and we'll see that we can make time much, much faster so that we see some movements on the stars. I'll start time and I'll increase it. I'll increase the um, work factor a lot. And at some point we will start seeing the stars move. Yeah, so as you can see, 
Um, here, the Hyades are moving in that direction. The Pleiades in the background are moving in that direction. Um, Orion is um, slowly getting uh, disbanded, and there's lots of stars moving all over the place. So let's go back to the current time and back to the Earth. OK, um, that should pretty much cover the time. Well, I should mention that here you can edit the time. So here you can set whatever date uh, you want or use uh, this uh, just like we did with uh, Control R. Uh, this sets the time to the current time and then click OK to apply. OK, so let's look at the camera modes. Um, there's a few camera modes in this guy. Um, there's a focus mode that we've used so far. Uh, it's the only one that we have used. Um, then we have a free mode. Basically, in this mode, we are not locked to any object. We can use um, the mouse wheel to move uh, forward and backward without being locked to any object. Uh, we can use the um, left mouse button to change our view. So basically to um, change the direction. And we can use the uh, right mouse button to pan, so to move sideways. Um, this mode is uh, interesting if you want to kind of roam freely and for example, if you are if you have um, game pads or um, yeah game controller um, where you have two sticks, uh, you can move around with the free mode uh, easier than you could with the focus mode. Then we have a game mode. Um, when you change modes, uh, sometimes uh, this uh, little information window comes up. Here it tells you about the controls for this mode. I'll just remove this and now um, i'm just moving the mouse which is uh, which is locked to the direction of the camera and then i would use w a s and d to move around and this allows us to create much more organic movements then we have um this guy mode which is kind of boring you cannot uh, it's just a um, camera fixed on Gaia. Then we have a spacecraft mode. Um, this puts you in control of a spacecraft. Uh, I will not go into detail, but basically you can just move around uh, with an inertial uh, object and apply some thrust and yeah, move around with this. Then we have... Um, um, yeah, and finally, we have uh, these uh, three uh, field of view projection modes. Uh, in these, time is too fast, so let's. <laughs> so these basically project uh, whatever Gaia is seeing, so the focal plane of Gaia onto the screen so that you can see the stars as they go by. And let's put it to one. This is the real um, speed at which stars are observed by Gaia. They are obviously too bright here, so you could adjust their brightness here in the visual settings and make them smaller and so on. And we can project both uh, fields of view at the same time or just one of them. So here we have the, the first field of view. And the second field of view. Okay, um, yes, now let's have a look at the special render modes. We provide three, um, these being a uh, stereoscopic mode for 3D mode, um, the planetarium mode, and the panorama or 360 degree mode. So you can activate them by clicking on these buttons. Um, Stereoscopic mode uh, provides several profiles. So I just activated it now. And here it tells you um, go back to normal mode with Control S. So if I hit Control S, I'm back in normal mode. I hit Control S again, I'm in the stereoscopic mode. And we can change the profile with Control Shift S. And that's what I'll try now. So uh, I'm hitting Control Shift S now. 
and that puts us in a parallel view profile. Then again, this is an anaglyphic um, 3D mode that uh, you would um, see with this kind of glasses, the uh, red cyan glasses. Uh, this is a VR mode uh, for the VR headsets, which have a desktop um, kind of rendering scheme. And we have two 3D TV modes. This is a horizontal one and then the vertical one. And this is cross eye. So let's go back to normal mode like this. And let's have a look at the uh, planetarium mode. Um, basically, this um, projects the 180 degree. Uh, 180 degree view with this uh, dome kind of uh, projection. Uh, shortcut for this is Control P. If we go to the settings uh, dialog here in the planetarium mode, we can change some um, some settings for this. So, for example, the angle uh, can be modified. So, if I put increase this to wait, let's let's first enter this mode. And now I'll change this angle to 250, something like that, and I'll save. And as you can see now, the field of view is much larger. Let's bring it back to 180. Yeah, and finally, we have the um, panorama mode or uh, 360 mode. Uh, we have three different projections. This is the spherical projection. Then we use uh, Control, Shift, and K to change different projections. That's the cylindrical projection. And finally, we have the hammer projection here. And basically, what it does is it renders the scene in all directions and then composites this uh, uh, 360 image. Uh, we can activate and deactivate it with Control, K. So Control, K to enter it and exit it. OK, um, let's look at the um, components. So here we have this, all of these components that we can uh, toggle on and off. Um, first is the stars. So now I just toggle them off, and we have no stars anymore. Then on. Then we have planets. Uh, when I click on this, I will lose the focus because um, the Earth is a planet, and it will just disappear. So I'll just click on this and as you can see now I'm on free mode because we have no earth and I'll click on it again the earth is back but I need to focus on it again also moons um, satellites like uh, or a spacecraft like Gaia then we have asteroids and I'll click on this so that we can see the asteroids we can also make them move is time on no okay no Let's focus on the sun. And as you can see, there's like 14,000 something asteroids moving around. Uh, we can remove the orbits by clicking here so that we can we only see the objects. Let's remove the asteroids. We have also um, star clusters. Right now, we have uh, the uh, Gaia DR2 star open clusters catalog uh, in the background. We could uh, so each of these objects is also selectable. For example, this cluster, we can just uh, click on each of them and uh, move closer, inspect them, stop time. Then we have uh, Milky Way here. So if I click on this, the background goes away, but all, not only the background, but also the Milky Way model. So I'll just move away and I'll click on this so that the model appears. Oops. Let me focus on the earth. Okay. Also, um, here we have galaxies. So these are the rest of galaxies in the background. Uh, this is a uh, nearby galaxies catalog and also SDSS. Um, nebulae uh, on these are meshes. So I think right now we have only one mesh, which is um, dust. And you will see it appearing in the background. Um, so this is a dust map, which was produced by Kevin 
uh, with the data from uh, Amateur Paris, I, I don't know. Then we have um, three different grids, so equatorial grid, ecliptic grid, and galactic grid. And we also have a um, new object, which is the recursive grid, and this provides some good context whenever you're moving. As you can see, um, it's annotated with distances, and it just uh, it's just recursive as you move uh, in and out. So let's go to the Earth by default. I think it starts at the focus object, but we can change it here in interface. Um, recursive grid here, you can set the uh, origin to the reference system. In our case, it's the sun. So as, as soon as I uh, click save, uh, the origin of the recursive grid will uh, move to the sun. And we have these projection lines. So this is a bit weird because the grid is now in um, galactic mode, but we can change that and put it in uh, ecliptic mode with uh, shift E. And now it's on the ecliptic. We can um, select any object and we will get the projection lines. So as you can see, now we have uh, this star selected and we get the projection line from this grid. And if we change the grid to the equatorial grid, for example, we get it also there. Um, the orbits uh, with the labels, so we, we can also toggle labels on and off. These are just the annotations with the names. Uh, the orbits we've seen already, uh, these uh, are locations, for example, on the Earth. Um, there are some annotations depending on the distance. So we have some cities and um, oceans, etc. We also have country lines. Constellations here and constellation uh, boundaries. Let me just double off this. Um, the ruler, I will not uh, use this. The particle effects uh, um, out of the scope also. Uh, then atmospheres, as you can see, we can double them off. Also the clouds, so to have a clean earth. This is the axis, so this should uh, put uh, some axis whenever some of the grids are active. So right now we have the axis here on the sun. Maybe we move out so that we can see them better. Um, and here we have titles, which are unimportant, and other objects uh, also unimportant. And here we have um, velocity vectors, and that I would like to cover. So let's activate velocity vectors. And as you can see, some of the stars get uh, little arrows, which point in the direction in which they are moving. Um, if we have um, radial velocities, that is also incorporated. Otherwise, it's just a tangential velocity uh, promotion. So let's have a look. Uh, Let's see, um, maybe let's just uh, move closer to one of these stars. Um, we have here the number factor, which uh, increases the amount of stars that get uh, narrow. This is uh, to control the cluttering. And a length factor, which basically scales the length of these arrows. Um, we also can choose whether to show the arrowheads or not. And here we can um, set the color to different uh, mappings. So for example, by, by default, uh, we use the direction, but we can also use the speed or uh, whether it has radial velocity or not. So I think blue is uh, no radial velocity and red is, or uh, the opposite, I'm not sure. Just look it up in the docs. 
Then we have um, the redshift from the sun. So this never changes, but also the redshift from the camera. So in this case, um, the color changes depending on the position of the camera or the relative position of the star with respect to the camera. And a solid color, uh, which is just this blue. Okay, so now let's, um, how much time do I have left? Okay, about 15 minutes. Hmm. Yeah, let's go over the visual settings quickly. So here we can, um, let's go back. Here we can uh, use this toggle to increase or decrease the brightness of the stars. Um, we can use this brightness, brightness power to um, basically the stars which are bright, it makes them bright and the stars with a, which are faint, it makes them fainter. So if you put this all the, all the way to the left, more or less all of the stars have the same uh, visual appearance. If you move it all the way to the right, uh, you can see the bright stars very clearly. This is the star size here. Um, it affects all of the stars uh, in the same way. Uh, minimum star opacity, this is uh, not important. Uh, then we have the ambient light. This effect, effect, um, affects only the model objects like the Earth. So here and the, the moon or the dark side, we can um, increase the ambient light so that it gets illuminated. Then we can select or set the line width with this slider and the label size with this one. And elevation also uh, not important. Okay, so let's have a look at how to load uh, data sets. So there's uh, in Gaia Sky like um, three ways of loading data sets at runtime. The first one is using this button here. And uh, let me first remove the star data set uh, EDR3 default to remove it. Uh, just click on this pin icon here on the uh, EDR3 default. We'll see about that later. So um, I just clicked on it, and now we have no star data set. So let's try to load in uh, Hipparchus. Uh, I've got this view table here. Uh, I click on load, and here we have three options, um, whether we want to load it as stars with proper motions and positions and magnitudes and colors and whatnot or only particles. Uh, if we select this, only the positions would be used. So all of the stars would have the same brightness and color. Or star clusters, um, this would load them as spheres with a radius. So let's select stars and click OK to load them. As you can see here, we get the um, uh, progress bar and now Hipparchus is loaded in the background and it appeared here also. Um, okay, let's um, have a look at how would we go about uh, loading a new data set using SAMP. And for that, I will remove this uh, data set that we have just loaded and launch um, docket. Okay, uh, let me limit the frame rates in the background, otherwise mm, let's set it to 60. Okay. So um, I'll just go ahead and try to get Hipparchus using tab. Um, I think Hipparchus is uh, here at the RE. Um, Gaia service, external catalog, see Parcos, and here I'll just get the full table. And let's see, I'll increase this and increase this and run the query, and that should get us uh, the full um, Parcos. Yeah, it's here. So, what we can do now is um, I'll just move this out of the way. And I'll send the table to Gaia Sky, and you will see that uh, the window to load the new data set pops up. So let's just send it. And as you can see in Gaia Sky, we got the message. Um, so here, I'll just go ahead and use the defaults and let it load. 
so again, the loading uh, progress bar here, and we have debuggers again. This time it comes from um, from Topcut. And I think now we could we need to activate something um, so that no. Maybe someone can help me here. I think there's a way to um, broadcast the row. Or is it? Mark, can you help? Uh, yeah, Tony. So if you, what you want to do is broadcast a row when you click on it. Then, yes, exactly. Um, Go to the, uh, if you look in the views menu. Uh -huh. link. Activation, maybe? Uh, yeah, activation actions, that's it. Chen row index, that's it, right? Uh, yes. It. Okay, yeah, thanks. So now we can select any row here and the uh, star gets selected also in Gaia Sky and we can also use it the other way around. So click here and as you can see the Maybe row gets selected the, in top cut which on the off the planets a little bit so that the stars are easier to be seen what's what's that show switch off the planets you mean yeah just just that that you are not confused too much uh, by by the planets um, maybe that's just a suggestion yeah it's, it's okay um, okay, so that should uh, pretty much cover um, how to load uh, and operate uh, data sets with Sam. I'll just go ahead and close up it. Um, the last um, way of loading data is with scripting and it's um, probably out of the scope of this tutorial also. Um, we'll talk about scripting at the end, but uh, maybe not. I'm not sure whether we have time or not uh, about how to load data. So let's uh, just very quickly go over how to um, work with data sets. So here we have all of the data sets and we can, we can uh, for, for each of them, we can uh, highlight uh, the data set. So I'll just highlight uh, this uh, Hipparchus that uh, came from the top cut. And as you can see, all of these, all of the stars are highlighted using this color. We can change the highlight color, um, for example, to this pink. Um, you may have noticed that the brightness of the stars increased a lot when I highlighted them. We can change that uh, here. There is a size increase factor when highlighting and a checkbox, which makes all stars visible, even if they are very far away and very faint. So I'll just... Just, just a, a small um, explanation. The size factor is actually a magnitude offset. Yeah. Yeah, it's not the size in pixels. So now if we, um, as you can see now, only the color changes and the um, visual appearance of stars stay the same. So uh, let's just put this at two. Okay. Um, what else can we do? Um, we can uh, use a plain color or we can also map the color to, e to a property and with a color map. So uh, I'll use this rainbow color map here and I'll map uh, one of the properties, which, um, which is not the basic property. For example, the number of transits here, I'll click okay and then I'll highlight the data set. And as you can see now, if I go to um, panorama mode with control K, now we have this um, observation. Uh, so the number of transits uh, is uh, mapped to the color of the stars. You can do that with any of the um, with any of the uh, properties. And just the highlight. This this would be really a, a scientific um, demonstration. If you want to have, let's say, the metallicity, and the metallicity is in your BO table, you can say color them according to your metallicity or whatever property is in your file. That that's the the usefulness of this um, um, uh, coloring of the according to properties. Yeah, by by default. Um... 
task guide loads everything and you can use any property to map as long as it's a number. Otherwise, um, if it's like a, um, an enumeration, you can use a column map like this, but uh, some tweaking may be, might be required to make it work fine. So um, then I will just um, explain the filters. We can add filters to any data set on an arbitrary number of them. Um, for example, now I will just uh, filter this Arcos data set by right ascension. Uh, so I'll stay with the, so I'll, I'll filter the stars which are, um, whose uh, right ascension is larger than 180 degrees. That means that I will keep only the ones in which right ascension is smaller. And as you can see, half of the sky disappeared. Maybe I'll uh, go back here and zoom out. Maybe I'll bring up the um, equatorial grid so that you can see that the data set is actually filtered. Oops, crash. Okay, let's bring it up again. So Tony, uh, just between the loading, maybe you'd uh, show how to save frames, uh, make screenshots, and maybe uh, very shortly uh, on how to record a video or so. I don't know whether this... Um, no, I'm, I'm not showing how to record a video because this depends on the, the operating system. Yeah, yeah, um, okay, okay, okay. So, uh, the frame output, um, it was uh, towards the end. I think we can just skip it. Mm. We also have the camera paths, but I'm not sure that maybe we can also skip it because we're short on time and I would just go on to scripting already. Yeah, okay. If you agree. Um, I'll just mention well, I, that. I, I will need it for uh, that a little bit of basic knowledge is uh, there before I start my presentation. That's fine. Yeah. So um, there's uh, so now we've finished more or less the filters. There's this external information. This is just uh, the connection to uh, Wikipedia, for example. Um, any object um, that you see this button here plus info, uh, you can click and it will pull uh, information from the Wikipedia API. Um, it works for stars. So as long as there's a Wikipedia article, it will get pulled. Um, also, we have a connection to the archive uh, for stars, so it uh, gets data from the archive that displays it here. And you can also get a link to Simbat. Mm. Then there's a camera paths. Um, just know that uh, you can create camera paths and play them back uh, at a later point. They are saved to a file. Uh, if you need more information, uh, just uh, go ahead and look up the, the video tutorial that I made, I think on camera paths or uh, read about it in the docs. And for the, those who came later, there, there is a link in the wiki, wiki page of this meeting where you find the um, different tutorials that Tony has created. So, so you have, can um, look up much more uh, in videos than just this uh, presentation here. Yeah. So let's... Uh, have a look, a quick look at scripting. So Gaiskai has an API, um, which you can tap into basically via Python scripts. Um, if you go to the uh, script of uh, this session at the bottom, there's this scripting session and it, uh, there's a link here to the uh, scripting section in the docs. And basically what you need is you need to install Py4j. Uh, Gaiaskai exposes uh, via server uh, Py4j um, uh, socket. And then you can use Python very easily to um, run um, sort of or execute uh, some uh, functions in Gaiaskai. Um, so you can install it uh, like this, Py4j. And after that, you can use um, scripts uh, like this. So basically, you need this header in each of your scripts. You need to put this at the beginning. 
and then your user code would go here, all of the calls to the Gaia Sky API, and at, at the end, you need to shut down the gateway. Um, examples of functions are, for example, so wait, this uh, we get here a gateway. Um, this is basically the server in Gaia Sky, and then from that, we get uh, this GS object, which contains all of the functions that you can call. What are these functions? Um, well, we can go here and all of these functions are defined in this uh, Java log. Um, you can, there's lots of them, uh, like probably hundreds. So you can um, just have a look at the Java logs or you can also have a look at the um, test scripts and uh, that's what I'll do now. So basically we have um, this guy here and I'll navigate to the uh, uh, set scripts and showcases. This contains um, sort of advanced scripts and I'll have a look at this asteroid store. And here there's this header. Here is a header and then here I'm running um, I'm executing stuff in Gaia Sky, and at the end, there's the shutdown. So what this does is it uh, basically um, activates the asteroids, and then it uh, creates some camera movements around. Uh, it activates orbits and then deactivates them, and in the end, it just uh, brings everything back. So uh, I'll just run this very quickly. To run it, uh, you just need to run it um, with the system uh, Python interpreter. So uh, straight store. First, you should uh, make sure that you have uh, Py4j installed. So if you do something like this and it brings back uh, the version, then you're good to go. And I'm just running it. And as you can see, guys, guy is uh, something is happening there, um, which is controlled by this uh, script that's running. So this is a bit slow. Now we are activating the orbits. Now the asteroids, and uh, I think I'll stop it here because uh, this kind of overlaps with what Stefan needs to uh, present. Okay. So I'll stop my sharing and um, it's, I, yeah, Stefan, you can take over. Yes, okay. Um, maybe in the, while I am loading that, you are answering two questions from one by Sergey. The orbit trails of Gaia is in the co-rotating reference frame. The trail of the moon is in the Earth center, but not non-rotating frame. The trails of planets are shown in the Bari center and not rotating reference frame. Can you yeah. say? So what, what is the question? Yeah, Sergey, maybe you, you ask uh, in the meantime when I start my part. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, I'm just thinking about using Gaia Sky for education. Mm -hmm. And from that point of view, and only from that point of view, this is quite confusing. So you are using uh, different reference frames uh, to, to draw the, the trails, depending on which object you are showing. Yes. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. This was just my confusion. It is not um, even a, a, a Actually, I got initially the, the uh, orbit of Gaia. Uh, but I had to um, convert it using the idea of the sand. Right, um, right. No. So uh, you, you can, I mean, it's it's just an, a file with the data. So if you, I, I can prepare it for you so that you have the orbit of Gaia in a different reference frame very easily. And 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 is it possible to switch off orbital uh, the trails of um, particular objects? Only all all of them. Um. Yes, but you need to um, edit them out in the uh, data files. So there are some oh, okay. data descriptors and you just comment out a line and then, uh, so okay, there's okay. no oh, graphical, um, controls for that yet. Okay, okay, it's fine. Mm -hmm. Very great. Uh, Tony, you are, you, are, you are magic. <laughs> it's, it's amazing, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thanks.
Yeah, that, that's that's really something that I fully agree. And my my uh, pri privilege is that whenever I need a, a something for a new outreach videos, I can go to Tony and ask, uh, can you please add this and this feature? And that's exactly what, what one needs in order to get uh, the videos and things like that done that we have created for EDR3, for instance. So thank you very much, Tony. And now I want to show you a little bit how I created the video for the 100 parsecs. Uh, um, um, uh, uh, science demonstration or performance demonstration paper. And uh, for that, I have prepared a video on my own, which shows the little bit the steps. So something that Tony didn't show, but which you can definitely find in his tutorials is, and in the documentation is how to switch on the um, how to switch on the recording of single frames. So what you get is a directory where you have single frames and that you have to convert to a video with, for instance, FFmpeg. There are definitely different, different um, tools in order to do that. And um, so assume that you have done that and you know how to do that. And so I start a little bit on uh, what is done and I, I made a small video where you see the the commands and then you see so to say the steps and you have seen with Tony that you have a script and in this this case there is a script which is about th three times this length which are used for the creation of the 100 parsec video and of course at the moment you don't see anything because uh, we have to zoom in and we will do that in a moment and then we see also some things that uh, Tony mentioned here. You have the header, this gateway uh, creation, and you are enabling input and doing some, some uh, scripting commands. Um, and these are all defined in the introduction. Here you set the stellar brightness, the star size, the opacity, the brightness level, contrast level, everything that you want to know, line with uh, everything that you can control, you can control with such a script. You are uh, turning on how fast the camera should rotate. That's something that you empirically should um, um, change a little bit if you want to have faster or slower speed. You are then setting the visibility of uh, planets or moons or Gaia or the constellations, whether you want to see the constellation lines, the, element, the velocity vectors, how um, large they will be uh, is set by that, the labels, whether you want to have them on or off uh, and so on. And then in the next part of the video, uh, of the script, uh, which, which I put, uh, or, which you can download by the way, of course, um, is something to make subtitles because you want to have explanation what's happening. And so I have a small um, Gaia uh, Python routine in which uh, at a given time I have a message on in Gaia Sky, but also creating for that moment uh, something which goes into a subtitle uh, file. And this can be, for instance, loaded into v v uh, VC, uh, um, VC, VLC, the the player, or you can also upload them into YouTube uh, so that you have subtitles. You can uh, then, uh, so to say, inform people. You can use that or not, and, but I will show you how this is done. And here are some things that you should, for this video, put into uh, the, the configuration in Gaia Sky itself. It's just a reminder. Uh, you can do that or not. And, and, and then here is, you are hiding the normal catalog that is loaded. That's the EDR3 extra large catalog that I have by default and I'm switching that on off at the moment. And then I have a data set path where all my uh, data files are. And here are data sets uh, where I loaded the 100 parsec sample that, that was created by the um, performance demonstration paper group. And here is the file name. And here are some of the color by which I want to highlight the data set. And also um, uh, here are the Hyades and the Coma Berenike um, uh, open cluster that I want to um, highlight and binaries I want to highlight. Uh, that's uh, something. And at the, mo at the beginning, I'm hiding the data sets before everything starts. At this moment, nothing is recorded. Uh, then um, I'm showing the data set of the 100 parsec sample that's used with this, G you are always using this GS plus the command uh, because this GS has been defined in the header of the Python script. And then here I switch on and define the file where the subtitles should go. Uh, you can use that or not. 
And here I'm defining my frame rate. That's not a command from Gaia Sky, but something that I will define in Gaia Sky. And then here, of course, in principle, one should command out what you are not using. Here you define the resolution of the video, then the video path where should the video be then uh, saved. And here are you are configuring the um, the where, what is uh, where, how the video is rendered. This is the resolution that I defined there in either 4K or HD or a smaller version. I suggest that if you are um, uh, starting with creating a video, uh, use a low resolution in order to make some tests whether it runs in principle, and then you are uh, increasing the. Um, the um, resolution because it takes some time. It's not in real time. If you have 4K videos, it will be much slower than the real time um, video uh, frame rate. Here's the frame rate. Here's the video path and the file, the directory where the, um, the result should go to. And here is how the different uh, single frames are named. They they have this hundred pass example name underscore and then if uh, five digits for the numbering the zeros video until the last video is shown. And then um, here you define the simulation time at what time in in uh, the video should start. And here you see it's. Uh, um, um, one o'clock in the afternoon on the uh, 3rd of uh, December, so the opening of the Gaia uh, video. And um, then you are, I'm defining that I want to start with a view to the earth and then to the sun. Uh, I'm going to the sun uh, and going, having the sun with a 20 degree um, size uh, on the screen. That's what, that's what I want to start with. And here, I, this means always uh, you sleep for five seconds in that case. Uh, there is another sleep with, where you just can omit the frames, but, but uh, I have used that uh, at that time. And then you set on the cinematic view to have the smooth behavior of the video. And then you reset the image sequence number that it's really starting with zero. Uh, and then you uh, define a start frame that's only for the uh, subtitle file so that it knows at what uh, frame uh, corresponds to what uh, time uh, which is used in the uh, subtitle file. And then you set the focus to the sun and then you uh, then the output is started. And now I show you in the rest of the video, the video itself and the commands which are done at certain steps of the video. So in a moment you will, we will uh, go to the, um, what is so to say produced while I also show you the commands. So I will stop here. This is the starting point. We are now at the sun, very close to the sun. And this is by uh, having the camera focus on the sun, which, which you put in quotes here. And then you uh, put on the frame rate, uh, frame output. I, we have seen that already on the slide before and we want to sleep for three seconds so that after the frame output starts, we want to stay on this picture for three seconds. That's what this command does. And now it continues and stop. I stop here and now I write the subtitle. This is my, um, my subtitle. A routine which is called and you need to you put in here a string we start our tour of the sun uh, at the solar neighbor at the sun so i'm abbreviating that sometimes so that it fits on the screen and then i wait for five seconds so you uh, can look at this uh, subtitle for five seconds before anything else uh, is uh, going and so we are continuing and now i stop and uh, here, uh, here now we get another string. Now we move from the, our sun seeing the planets and so on going uh, away. And what it does is it, it um, goes to the sun, which is a little bit ridiculous because we were at the sun, but we are making the radius uh, seem smaller and smaller. And this is um, done in within 15 seconds. These are all commands that you find in the uh, in the documentation of Gaia Sky. So this is something where you move backwards uh, and you will see the planets um, going backwards. So now you see Venus and Jupiter and Saturn going away and we are moving further outwards. And after 10 seconds, by the way, the, the um, the um, subtitles are switched off. 
So we are going further and further outwards, outwards until we see the 100 pass example from outside. And then now we are waiting for two seconds again. We are doing a sleep command. Um, so this um, hashtag, by the way, means the, the um, waiting, sorry for the typo here. Uh, these are only um, um, comments on what, what is happening there. This is the real command for two seconds. And now we are at this distance and now we, the following happens, we switch on, we define a variable uh, called speed. Uh, it could be, I have set that to 0.1 and then there is a command camera rotate where you put in this variable speed and uh, this defines the, the, the direction of the rotation and uh, the speed is 0.1 and now the camera rotates around the sun because this is still in focus. And now the camera starts to rotate and we will uh, also switch off the labels. There are no labels shown at the moment. And then you rewrite to the, um, to the uh, subtitle file, this uh, string that you see down here. And now you see that the stars are rotating around the sun. And so you see now from outside the 100 pass example. And now I stop again. We write again a string to the subtitle file, which is seen here. And within 30 seconds, we are now getting closer to the sun again. We are using another, so to say, radius of the sun, and we are doing this within 30 seconds. So we are moving inside. And we are stopping. Uh, it's, uh, and uh, we have now five, uh, we are waiting for another five seconds. and. Uh, we are uh, continuing to, um, to um, move and the subtitle is still on. And now we uh, have another subtitle besides the position and so on. Uh, and that is shown for two seconds. And now uh, you switch on the, um, the, the, the arrows showing the velocity vectors of the stars. I omit um, the radial velocities because we don't have the radial velocities for all stars. So in fact, these are actually proper motion vectors. And here is the number defined and also the color mode. This, is, this is, means that they are just um, in, in, uh, in blue color as Tony has shown. And this uh, the command makes the switches on the arrows. It's, it sets the visibility to true in this case. And then we wait for eight seconds. Um, and now we see the, why we are still rotating, we are seeing the um, velocity vectors of the uh, star. Now we um, uh, switch on the, this command, which so that it explains the velocities of the stars are indicated by the vectors. And we are sleeping, we are uh, waiting for nine seconds um, because the, um, the, the string is seen for eight seconds. So we always make the waiting time a little bit larger than the other. And then we are uh, sleeping again after we are switching then the, the velocity vectors off. So after some nine seconds, the velocity vectors will be switched off as you will see in a moment. So now they are switched off and we have a new, new string. Many stars have companion stars uh, as, as it's defined here. And this is shown for five seconds. The, the subtitle uh, goes for four seconds. And move together with the same velocity. This is explaining something about binaries. And now stop. Uh, we are now showing the data set binary, which we have uploaded from the group of the 100 parsec circle. They have um, marked the binaries and I put that into one file. And this is highlighted here with yellow color by setting the blue and red color to one. And by that, the binaries will be shown as yellow uh, binaries. And um, then we will uh, put also um, write this uh, into the subtitle files, which is shown here as well, and wait for five seconds. So now in a second, you will see that some of the stars in the background are all already yellow. And now we are visiting one of the star. So I selected just one star with this uh, telephone number from the source ID of Gaia. And we are going there 
uh, um, using this angle, angular distance and uh, within 10 seconds. And here uh, it says we are visiting, visit one of the binary stars. And now we are flying to this star, uh, which I have uh, looked at, um, uh, selected before and uh, used the source ID. And now we are here and in the moment we will switch on the on the vectors again, the velocity vector, so that we see that, by the way, if you are looking closely, so I'm going a little bit backwards, and we are now going for the, sorry, it was a little bit more backward. But I don't want to make it more complicated. So now we are going to this star that we have defined and then we switch on the velocity vectors. And you see there is one star in the background which uh, has the same velocity. Maybe it's not an accident uh, because it's very close to these, to these pairs. We, is, we are going to another one, which we also defined here. And we are always rotating further around these stars because they are focused, they are focused most and we are in cinematic mode so that it continues until you are, and then we are going to the star cluster Hyades where we have selected one star of the Hyades and we are moving around that and we are having another subtitle and then we are highlighting the data set um, also in yet yellow color in this case. And we are rotating around that, switching on the velocity vectors and waiting for a moment and uh, telling something to explain the public what we are uh, talking about, why the stars have the same velocity, uh, spatial velocity. And then we are also going to the second cluster within the 100 pass example, the Kuruma Berenike cluster, where we also go to one star and rotate around it. And then we, uh, here you see that's the small arrows, they, the other stars in the vicinity usually have larger arrows. And then now we move outwards of the whole 100 parsec sample, um, they color all the stars of the 100 parsec sample in yellow and move away from that. But basically we are moving away from the sun again and uh, that's the trick. And then we see that how small the, this is uh, compared to the Milky Way. We, uh, we switched on the Milky Way by setting the Milky Way offset um, on. And now I do something which is a little bit more complicated. I have before looked at what position I wanted to see to the Milky Way and um, save the position, the um, orient, the direction of the camera and the upward direction in this array and uh, made a camera transition, which is a, then a linear transition from one camera position to the other. And that's what I did at the, at the end because I wanted to have a specific look at the camera. And now we see that. And if you are looking carefully, you see here the still the yellow dot there. So we know where the 100 pass example basically is. And that uh, is, was my short presentation. I know it's much too fast probably to, uh, know everything about that, but uh, notice everything about that, but um, maybe we should have something like uh, such a tutorial again so that you are, you could more follow, but this should give you some insight of what is actually possible with Gaia Sky and um, yeah, if you now have some questions to either uh, Tony or me, uh, you can still ask some question in a quarter of an hour, we should definitely be um, um, sh we should leave because then the next uh, um, splinter meeting will start. So are there any questions to Tony or to me? Just go ahead. Um, Stefan, maybe I have a question. Yes, please, Andreas. Yes, I think you said it, but I, I, I missed it. So uh, I, I know how to script in, in Gaia Sky, uh, but uh, so are you saying that the individual frames are uh, saved on hard disk and then you have to make a movie out of the individual frames? Is that correct? 
Yes, exactly. Um, the okay. FFM pack is the, at least if you are using a Unix uh, yes. computer, probably also on Windows and I know on, on Mac that that works. So you have a file and you have them numbered from zero to something, then it's very easy to, um, to render a video file from that uh, with different quality settings of FFM pack. And okay. that, that is the way to do it. Great. So, sounds very easy. I mean, one has to look at, into it, but it sounds very easy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there are many small things and details that we cannot easily cover in such a small time. The, of, of course. There, there, is, there is actually a full guide on how to um, yes. create a video out of uh, Gaia Sky Frames in the yeah. uh, docs. Okay. And yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are there more questions? Uh, hey, Robin here. Mm -hmm. um, thanks, uh, first of all. And then I have a question. You, you said that you are not speaking about the VR stuff, which is understandable. But uh, I wonder, can you give a very short um, update on how things are going there in this direction? Um, yeah, so basically, we updated uh, the backend uh, with the Gaia Sky version 3. But um, at some point, we want to move to OpenXR. Uh, right now, we're using um, open VR uh, by Valve. Um, yeah. I think OpenXR is already supported uh, by um, uh, Steam VR and some others. Uh, but um, since we're using uh, Java bindings and they have not yet uh, updated the library so that OpenXR is supported, uh, we, we just need to wait for now. Uh, other than that, I have plans uh, to. Um, redo the interface, so properly implement um, the interface into uh, an object, so a 3D object in VR, but that will probably take um, some time. Let's, let's leave it at that. Okay, okay, yeah, oh, that's, that, sounds, uh, that sounds good. And another question um, regarding the videos, um, is there anything which speaks against using such a, um, screen recording software, which is no. delivered with the high-end graphic cards? No, I usually capture videos all the time uh, and they are good enough. Um, okay. But if you want to have like, uh, to do it in a very methodically way or methodical way, then you're probably better off using frames um, yeah, okay. with a very high resolution. Yeah. Otherwise you can just record the screen. I, I do it all the time okay. uh, with, with OBS and yeah, quality is good. Oh, e even with OBS, it works. Yes, yes. <laughs> That's good. Okay. Yeah, thank you. That was so awesome. He, so here you see v v the VR version, and here is Nobel Prize laureate George Smoot, who used Gaia Sky, and here the the next astronaut from ESA, Matthias Maurer, who used also Gaia Sky. Just, this just as a small joke. Are there more questions? Uh, yes, uh, sorry, I, I'm, I have a quite technical question. Uh, at CNES, we, are, we have a proxy to get uh, access to the internet. And is, that a, is there a way to uh, uh, access to uh, internet uh, with Gaia Sky through a proxy? Um, no, not built into Gaia Sky, but you should somehow be able to set it up in the operating system so that it's transparent to the applications. So uh, the, the short answer is no, we, we have no uh, implementation of a proxy so that you can input uh, your uh, um, um, proxy um, uh, URL and everything into Gaia Sky, but maybe you can set it up so that it's transparent to uh, Gaia Sky, I'm not sure. Yeah, I will try it. Yeah, thank you. Let me just shortly, because I didn't mention that in the in our wiki, I have now a link to my NAS where um, um, where you can download also the video that I have shown as a as a um, presentation, and also there are the data files. One thing that you should notice: some sometimes there are small changes in Gaia Sky, so I cannot give a guarantee that the script that I have shown runs with every uh, future or Gaia Sky version, because that was a script that I made just before. 
EDR3. And um, there are sometimes smaller changes, but you will notice that and you certainly can easily correct that. Um, but so you can download with this link, you have to go to a directory where you can actually find uh, all what I have shown. And if there are breaking changes in the API, they are usually listed in the release notes for each of the releases. Um, okay. Usually we try to keep, uh, if you would change functions, we try to keep the old versions also in the API so that mm -hmm. compatibility doesn't break, but uh, sometimes it's just not possible and yeah. it uh, just breaks with, stuff. With, with the highlighting, there may be some recent change that I ask you to do. And so I think that from that, the behavior can be a little bit different uh, in that case, but that, don't mind. Um, uh, I think you still get the idea how this is done and you should always look at the newest um, routines which are compatible with your version and uh, often, usually these are small changes only. So are there more questions? Uh, a, a remark uh, regarding the proxy settings. Uh, the, the proxy uh, which is used by the Java JVM is set by the flag http.proxyhost and you can set it directly as a command line parameter for the Java JVM. So there's no need to build it in, I would say. Okay, let, let me tip it in. If you use uh, Windows or Mac, there's a file which is called guysky.vm um, properties or VM options, and you can add your VM flags there. Yeah, it's with the uh, dash uh, capital D and then HTTP proxy hosts. Just just um, Google it. I mean, JVM proxy setting or something like that. So my dream, of course, is that more people will in the future use Gaia Sky also to produce videos like uh, a few people, uh, me and Tony and so have done for outreach. I have just created a new video that will at, at some point uh, go online from ESA uh, on the Hyades Tales where there is a new paper on uh, and things like that. And it would be very good if others could, could do that as well so that uh, we will have more interesting videos uh, on uh, with Gaia Sky in the future. And uh, for that, we are definitely open to um, help again if you have more questions and need more instructions uh, that we will definitely both uh, Tony and I help in that case. Probably in the technical questions, oh, Tony will be the one who has to answer that. But if it comes to scripting and some experience, definitely I'm the one who could also help. More questions? Um, I was asked to post the link to your, my example script. Yes, I, I, I will post the, the uh, script for, the, uh, for my NAS where you can um, download that. Uh, so in a second, this should work. Uh, so it doesn't work between one o'clock and eight o'clock in the morning because I switch off my NAS uh, in the night. Okay, if that there are no more questions and I guess many of you will go to the next uh, Splinter meeting. Uh, I thank you very much for your attention and uh, Tony very much for this beautiful program and uh, all the, I really have to thank you for the very, very good cooperation that we had for uh, producing outreach videos and uh, your flexibility to often when I have a request on the same day, uh, fulfill the request with new features. And that, that is extremely uh, nice uh, that, that I have such a good collaborator in Tony and um, really a master in visualization. Thank you very much for uh, Tony and uh, thank you very thank you. much all of you. Yes, thank you, Tony. It's really, really great software that you're developing there. Truly. Yeah, that's that's true. And also, uh, thank you, Tony, and thank you, Stefan, also. Thank I you. Mean, this is a lot of work. Thanks yes, exactly. Yeah. And in the outreach meeting, maybe we will discuss a little bit whether there are any features needed for DR3. Uh, I, I, I'm thinking about variable stars and things like that. So think about what you think is needed in Gaia Sky for DR3. It's not always uh, uh, that Tony can 
uh, implement that, but if possible, um, maybe we could have some ideas of that kind. But now I think I, we should close so that uh, I will not, uh, that the next uh, splitter meeting can start. Okay, thank you very much and uh, see you some of you at the um, splinter meeting for outreach tomorrow and uh, thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.